So 10 years ago, I walked nervously down the stairs of this old German firehouse, and I pushed open a steel, steel door to see for the first time a small team of eight soldiers. I was a fresh grad, college graduate, and I was a new officer in the United States Army. And I, I, I remember their eyes looking at my rank and then analyzing me from top to bottom. I was skinny, I was young, and, uh, and I, did, I, would, I didn't look like I had much uh, to offer. But I was supposed to lead these guys. And what do I do? So how do you get a bunch of people who obviously have a lot more experience than you to listen to you and respect you? Looking back at it now, I'm actually kind of embarrassed at the approach I took. You see, I, I graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, that's an academy that breeds leaders like Eisenhower and MacArthur. Both of my brothers attended that academy, and my father had a long, respected career in the Army. So I was primed for leadership. But deep down inside, I was very scared of leadership. My charisma level was questionable. My competency level was probably just about average. Uh, and with the war in Afghanistan on my horizon, I was questioning myself, am I really prepared and ready to be responsible for other people's lives? So I left West Point with the idea or in the understanding of the science of leadership. To me, that meant a very long list of do's and don'ts. And these are things passed down from one great leader to the next. And as long as I memorized these lines and these processes, I would be a wonderful leader in the Army. So there I stood. There I was, right in front of a team of soldiers, saying the things that I think I was supposed to say and doing the things that they told me I should be doing. So this is my first point. Leadership is not about memorization, and it's definitely not a checklist. Over my years uh, in leadership experience in the Army, and after interviewing and, and listening to stories from dozens of successful leaders that I respect and their subordinates, I've been able to identify one attribute that is shared across all of their stories. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. If you focus your time on that one attribute, you'll be remembered as a leader far longer than the time you actually led. You just have to sincerely do one thing, and that's to care. That's it. You just have to truly care about others. I know that sounds soft and probably not that concrete, especially coming from a military guy, but it, in the end, that's the touchy-feely stuff that actually wins in the end with leadership. It's the one thing that we've always wanted when we were growing up through the ranks, that a leader cared about us. And somehow, when we become leaders, we forget that. Because we all have needs. We all want to feel like we're learning, we're growing, we're achieving recognition, and we're being accepted. And a caring leader makes sure that happens. I'm going to share with you three wonderful examples of leaders, uh, caring leaders, in action today. So, like I said, I, I talked to a lot of people about their leadership stories, uh, and I was I, able to identify one special phrase. I call it a magical phrase, and it's, I need you. Remarkable, right? How many times have you used that phrase in your life? You know, I have a two-year-old son, and every once in a while he says, Daddy, I need you. And I drop everything I'm doing. I pick him up, and I hold him, and I don't want to let him go. Um, because something he said right there triggered something in my brain, and I wanted to physically react and help him out. He said it so sincerely. I believe that we, this can also happen when human, when human adults interact with other adults. Saying the phrase, I need you, makes us act, makes us want to do something, as long as it's said with sincerity. I talked with an Army pilot who was able to use that phrase, I need you, and see powerful results. So this pilot, he was in charge of 20-plus soldiers that were headed to Iraq. Now, he had never been to Iraq, and neither had the majority of his, his unit. However, he did have two very... Um, very senior uh, soldiers on his team and that had been to Iraq multiple times. 
In the army, we called these people salty because they're well-seasoned. So as he went on training up his unit, he started to notice that these two senior soldiers were never around. They were always at a distance. And sometimes they were mocking his training and undermining his leadership. Weeks of this frustration went by, and he finally went up to these soldiers and said, can I talk with you outside? He brought them outside, and he stood across from them, looked at them in their eyes, put his hands on their shoulder, and said, I need you. Those soldiers looked back at him, and instantly there was something new in their eyes. It was, it was a, a look of shock at first, but that pilot went on to tell him, I empathize with the fact that you've probably done this a thousand times, and you probably don't need this training. However, I need you. This team needs you. I need to bring this entire team back from Iraq. I need your help. It was instant change in these guys. A new level of professionalism uh, entered their, their, their minds, and their attitude con uh, immediately changed. A year later, after bringing back the entire unit home safely from war, the pilot received two emails, one from each of these senior soldiers. And they said how touched they were that somebody recognized their value and understood what kind of contribution they could make to that team. You see, this is the power in that phrase, I need you. But why is it so powerful? Because this pilot was able to open up a vulnerability, something that he couldn't do himself and could only be filled by these two soldiers. And he was able to expose himself and swallow his pride and for the betterment of his team, because he cared so much about their safety, he was, able to, he was willing to exchange that pride. So remember that phrase, I need you. A second story that I want to share with you will hopefully illustrate uh, something uh, that I believe is very important, which is understanding your, your team members and challenging them to reach their potential. I recently talked to a, a very young veteran who was once the only female officer in her army unit. Now she was a very short, uh, about five foot tall, petite woman, and she was part of a very masculine alpha male environment, which can be intimidating. And she told me story after story about this boss at that unit and how he challenged her to exhaustion, and she loved it. You see, he was, he was six foot four, athletic build, and a booming voice. And when he talked, people moved. And he didn't coddle her. Instead, he challenged her to achieve more. And the way he did that was he sat down with her and he asked her things about her life. He wanted to understand what she's good at and what her potential is. And she recalled a, uh, one of the first company meetings she had with this person, with this boss. And the, the boss had to make this very uh, critical decision. And he actually had the ability probably to make that decision on the fly. He was a very capable boss. However, instead of making that decision, he directed everyone's attention to the back of the conference room, to where this young female officer was sitting, and asked her for her recommendation. A couple more experiences like this of publicly showing trust in her, and she felt totally comfortable. She felt like she can contribute to this unit and that everything that, that, that she did, she felt proud of. And this was an environment she could thrive in. She did. As a caring leader, you should be looking for the potential in your team members. And when you discover that potential, you should call it out, just like this boss did. Because the truth of the matter is, everybody likes to be challenged. Everybody likes to have the task that allows them to open their minds and be creative. You can, you can inspire internal motivation in your team members by challenging them with opportunities that they can show their strengths. As a last point, I want to, I want to help you maybe change a paradigm of a, from a taking mentality to a giving mentality. Now, when we start new jobs, typically we say things like this. I'm going to learn so much from this new job. Or we say, 
after I'm done with this job, I'll be able to write the title manager on my resume. And when it's time to leave, we pack everything up and we ship off, leaving hardly anything behind. But what if you switch that into a giving mentality? Your phrases would sound something like this. I'm going to give all that I have to make this team the best team possible. Or I'm going to give of my, uh, of my knowledge to my team members so they understand what to do with their careers. You see, that change from a taking mentality to a giving mentality totally changes what type of leader you're trying to be. Uh, I have a good friend of mine that's a... Uh, uh, we used to be a lieutenant in the Israeli army. He talked to me about it. He told me a, st a wonderful story about when he had this giving mentality. When he was a young officer in the army, he had this boss that he looked up to that was very competent. Unfortunately, and he always wanted to be a, a mentored by this boss. Unfortunately, this boss was entirely unapproachable. So he took that as a lesson. This is not what I want to be. I want to be a giving leader. So he was put in charge of a, team, a very diverse team of young and old people, both military and civilian. Uh, and he thought one day, I want to hold something that I'm going to call a dream session with these guys, a dream session. So he took the first, the youngest soldier of his unit, and he invited him to come outside with him. And under, under the warm air with some French fries sitting in front of him on the table, they started this dream session. They talked about their dreams. He asked him, what do you want to get out of your time here in this unit? And that young man opened up to him and said, I dream of one day having a college degree. I'm really concerned about my family and taking care of them. My young lieutenant, my lieutenant friend uh, imparted whatever advice he could, uh, could give him. But then he also link, said he'd link him up with people that he knew had the same situations. He was surprised, my lieutenant friend was surprised that this guy opened up so much to him. And he was, he was so excited to be able to help out. Uh, so he started continuing on here. He, every week he would take in a new soldier and take him outside and talk to him about their dreams. And then he would try to give as much as he could to that person. Sooner or later, the older senior members of his team who were twice his age were asking for dream sessions. He didn't know what he would tell them, but yeah, yeah I'll do a dream session with you. Um, that idea of a dream session or the... Uh, the actual concept of that started spreading like wildfire across his entire organization. People started to see changes in performance in his team. His peers that were leading other teams were asking him, how are you holding these dream sessions? And, he came to, and when he, we talked about it, he told me that there were two things that he felt he learned from these dream sessions, things that he was getting out of this. One, he was understanding his people a lot more. He was able to personally invite them to be a part of that mission. And then two, he felt like it was a lot easier now to give instructions and taskings to his team because he understood the whole person. He understood how they ticked. And they, wanted, and they were tied into the mission of this team. So this is the power of having a giving mentality versus a taking mentality. Think about how you can give more to your team. So in closing, I've now made the full transition from the military world to now the civilian workforce. And I can tell you that all people are the same, whether you're a soldier or a software engineer. They all want to know that you care. And when you truly care, you give much more than you take. And you give of your time to understand people and challenge them to reach their potential. And you constantly look for opportunities to tell people how important they are and how much they're needed. I want you to do this on Monday morning. I want you to go to your teams, and I want you to find someone that you probably don't know very well. And you don't have to be a leader to do this, but I want you to hold a dream session with them. Figure out what they want out of their lives and figure out how you can give to help them make that happen. This is what I want to leave you with today. Leadership in the end is a matter of the heart. When we care, we invest in people, and that gives us dividends for a lifetime. And that 
is what I now believe is leadership. Thank you.